Hello, options traders. I hope everybody's wrapping up a great week as this bull market continues to charge on full steam. And in this video, I wanted to answer a post from earlier in the week asking a very important question. Can we forecast future stock prices? And the answer is yes. It's a little technical, but we're going to cover it here in detail. But don't worry about it because most of the sophisticated brokers platforms out there these days, at least the options trading platforms, will show this to you. What's more important is that you understand what you're looking at and how to interpret these numbers and understand the assumptions on which they're built. But for those who are so inclined, I'm also going to show you how you can calculate these numbers on your own. Well, first off, why is this important? Why do we care if we can give an estimated guess as to what the future stock price may be? Well, it allows us to make informed decisions on which strikes to buy or sell. So it's a form of risk management. All too often, you'll see that traders may sell out of the money strikes thinking that they have a high chance of expiring out of the money or expiring worthless. But after looking at the numbers, they found out maybe it's not such a good idea. The option actually has a higher chance of going in the money than what they originally thought. Conversely, maybe you'll find traders that buy out of the money strikes thinking that they have a decent chance of expiring in the money. But upon looking at the numbers, they find out, eh, not really such a great deal. It's not as good as I thought. So at a bare minimum, it's just a great way to figure out which strategies and which strikes are best for you. The reason we can do this is that it's based on stock price probability and that stock prices follow a random walk. And this just means that if you were to track stock returns over a long period of time, you're going to get a bell curve. So what do I mean by returns? Well, if the stock is trading at 100 today and it closes at 101, that's a 1% return. Maybe it closes down a half a percent tomorrow. Maybe it's up 3% the following day. If we were to track those numbers over time, we would get a bell curve. And the reason for that is that it's just the nature of randomness. Here we're looking at a digital version of what's called Galton's board, but it's just an array of wooden pegs. These are digital versions, and they would drop ping pong balls down through these pegs. And as the balls strike the pegs, they get jarred a little bit left or right, creating some random noise. And look what forms down at the bottom. We get a bell curve. And the reason for this is that each time the ball strikes a peg, it has a decision to make as to whether to jump right or left. There's about a 50-50 shot of that happening. So it's as if the ball is flipping a coin each step of the way. Half the time the coin lands heads, half the time it lands tails. But on average, we're going to get an equal number of heads and tails. And so the ball should land on average in the center. And that's what we're seeing. That's where most of them fall. But every once in a while, we'll get those freak outcomes where we're going to get maybe 10 heads in a row or 10 tails in a row. And those balls will actually start to drift out into the wings. But that's what's forming this bell curve. Well, in a similar way, we can create some hypothetical stock prices here with a stock price simulator. And I just did this in Excel. But let's say we're going to start with a stock price of 100. And I'm going to, let's say, inject it with 20% volatility. And I'm going to turn this stock loose for 250 trading days, roughly the number of trading days in a year. And there it is, off to the races. And in this case, you can see that it stopped right about at the same price of 100. We're going to do it again. Another $100 stock, 20% volatility. And we're going to turn it loose for another 250 trading days. And again, close is very close to 100, but not exactly the same path. We do it a third time. We get another outcome. A fourth time, we keep doing this over and over, hundreds, thousands of times. And if we were to track those changes down at the bottom, those finishing stock prices, we would see that they fall into a bell curve. So it turns out that a stock price moving through time, if we were to turn that graph on its head, is exactly like dropping ping pong balls through this array of pegs. It's just random noise, different news, big trades come in, block trades, buy, sells, that kind of jar these stock prices up and down through the day. And that's really what's causing the effect of the pegs on the stock price on the chart on the right. So there is a tendency for stock prices over time, because of this little jarring effect, each trade is basically random, whether it's going to go up or down. And then over time, we end up with a bell curve. Here's some real world data that I collected for a full year back in period of 03 to 04 on eBay. And look at this. This is live data right here. And you can see that it basically forms a bell curve. 
look at the average right there in the center at zero. And that usually throws traders off track a little bit. The best estimate for a future stock price is today's stock price. And so on average, we expect a stock price to have a return of zero. That is your very best guess. But we also get deviations from that. And the bell curve shows us by how much. Now, for those of you who still don't believe that stock prices are mostly random, take a look at these two charts here I showed in a previous video. And they look like stock charts. But these were actually created with coins and dice. Coins determining whether the stock price was up or down. And the dice was a way of giving it some type of volatility. And we get beautiful patterns out of randomness. So if this looks like a stock price chart to you, then you should be able to convince yourself that stock prices are built largely on random noise. Once we realize that stock prices over time follow a bell curve, there's an important rule you probably remember from your basic statistics classes called the empirical rule. And we're going to see these numbers in just a little bit. So I want to cover it here. But under any bell curve, no matter what the shape, about 68% of the data falls within what is called one standard deviation. And that's that light blue area in this curve below. About 95% of all your observations will fall within two standard deviations. And that's the light blue area plus the dark blue area. And finally, almost all of your data, about 99.7% of it will fall under that bell curve or three standard deviations. Don't think that three standard deviations is the final frontier. There's a fourth, a fifth, and even a hundredth. They go on forever. But for the most part, all of your observations are going to fall under three standard deviations. Now, because different stock prices have different volatilities, they will form different shaped bell curves at the end of a trading period. So for example, if a stock has 10% volatility, you're going to get a very tall, skinny curve like the chart in the top. At 20% volatility, look what happens. Those stock prices tend to fan out and the bell curve gets a little shorter and a little wider to account for those future potential prices that can deviate from that center. At 40% volatility, look what happens. We get an even flatter and even wider bell curve. So as the volatility of the stock increases, the potential for future stock prices increases up and down. Well, how do we interpret volatility? First of all, understand that volatility is always assumed to be over a one year period. It's annualized, very much like an interest rate. So let's say that we have a $100 stock trading with 20% volatility, which your broker's platform will give you. Well, based on what we know about a bell curve, at 20% volatility, one standard deviation is therefore 20% times our current stock price. 20% of 100 is $20. Now all we have to do is to go back and apply it to the empirical rule. Because 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation, I can add 20 to $100 and I can subtract 20 from 100. And that's going to give me an upper and lower range. And I also know that's going to happen 68% of the time. So I could say that there is a 68% chance that this stock will be somewhere between 80 and 120 in one year. I could go two standard deviations, which means add another 20 and subtract another 20 from each of those numbers. And I would be 95% confident or I would say there's a 95% chance that the stock will be somewhere between 60 and 140 in a year. If I want more confidence, I can go out to a third standard deviation. Let's add another 20 and subtract another 20. And therefore, I'm almost 100% confident that the stock will be somewhere between 40 and 160. Please keep in mind, and this is very important, one of these assumptions here that we're making is that the only thing driving future stock prices is volatility. We're not assuming that Microsoft announces that it's going to get bought out tomorrow and it's trading for $200 and we say, therefore, the math didn't work. That's not true. The math is working, assuming that nothing is going to pick up that bell curve and plant it at a much higher or lower price. Could we get an earnings announcement that causes a big gap up or down? Yes. That doesn't mean that this math is incorrect. So the big underlying assumption is that the only thing driving the stock's price is volatility, not news. And we're also assuming that that volatility remains constant throughout the options life. Now, interestingly, if we go back to our simulation here, and remember, this is not made up data. It's an actual random simulation. And look at what the plus and minus three standard deviation marks are. 
Look right here at the top. This is our chart with 20% volatility, and right here at the top is $160, exactly what we predicted on the previous slide. Look down here at the bottom, starting to push towards 40. There's a reason we're not quite hitting that low, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But for the most part, you can see that if you let the stock prices run lots and lots of times, do lots of simulations, you're going to get roughly plus and minus three standard deviations. And it's this observation about stock prices that allows us to make reasonable predictions about where future stock prices may fall. So in that post that I put earlier in the week, this is a screenshot from Thinkorswim's TOS's platform, and this is what's called a probability of expiring cone. And this is what they do. They say, tell me how many days you want to project. This is for 30 days. And at what confidence level? Do you want to be 68% confident? One standard deviation? Do you want to be two standard deviations and therefore 95% confident? You can put those parameters in there on your own. What if you want to be 80% confident? Sure, you can put that in there. But this purple curve that's drawn here is for 30 days out at 95% confidence or two standard deviations from the current volatility. And take a look here, the high price is 43.28. And the low price down here is, looks like 31. It's kind of masked down here. This green bubble over here looks like 30.76 is really for that green line or that moving average line. So that purple number right there at 31 is getting a little bit blocked, but it looks like it's right at about 31. So basically speaking, the platform is projecting that in the next 30 days, eBay will be somewhere between 31 and 43.28. Well, how is it coming up with these numbers? Well, this is where it starts to get a little tricky. Not too bad, but it's a little bit tricky because remember, volatility is assumed to be over a one-year period. This is over 30 days. And unfortunately, we can't scale volatility like we can with interest rates. If I want to know what a six-month rate is, I divide it by two. A three-month interest rate, I can divide it by four. I cannot do that with volatility. And the reason is, is that volatility is proportional to the square root of time. So if we want to find monthly volatility, which is what we're doing here over 30 days, I need to scale it and I need to say my volatility is actually the square root of 30 over 360. If I wanted to know what volatility would be over a quarter, I would take the square root of 90 over 360. So it's always about the square root of time. What if you had an option that expires in 17 days? Take the square root of 17 over 360, and that's going to be your scaling factor. Now, as a side note, there's a lot of controversy as to whether we should use 360 or the number of trading days in a year of 250. Thinkorswim platform uses 250 trading days because after all, that's how many days it's only possible for a stock's price to change. But some books might show 360, some may show 250, Take your pick. It's not going to make a big difference. But for this video, I'm going to use 250 because that's what Thinkorswim uses. So let's go back to our chart. And down here at the bottom, we have historic implied volatility. So you can see that the Thinkorswim platform is telling us right here at the right, 0.2413, or a, just a touch over 24% volatility. And that's the volatility number that they are using to calculate this cone. So let's start with our volatility of 0.2413, and it helps to go out a number of decimals because once you start taking square roots and things, you can get into lots of rounding errors. So I usually like to work with four decimals here, and then we can round later. What's our monthly volatility? Square root of 30 over 250, again, because that's how many trading days there are roughly in a year. And that comes out to be 0.3464. So what this is telling us in a sense is that we can't use a volatility of, let's call it 24%. I need to only take 34% of that number. So my monthly volatility is going to be the annual 0.2413 times my scaling factor because we're only trying to figure out over the course of a month. So we're going to multiply that by 0.3464 and we get 0.0836. Now we work the calculations exactly the same way. One standard deviation is 0.0836. Two standard deviations is therefore twice that, or 0.1672. So I can either increase my stock price by 16.72% and decrease it by 16.72%. That's one way of looking at it. But most traders like to convert it to dollars like we did before. So I can say the stock was trading at 36.61 times 0.1672, 
comes up to be $6.12. So all I need to do is to add $6.12 to my current stock price to get the upper bound. So we would say it's $36.61 plus $6.12 or about $42.73 would be my upper estimate. To get the lower bound, I take the current stock price minus $6.12. So we're going to take $36.61 minus $6.12, or about $30.49. However, if we go back to our Thinkorswim chart, you'll see that they projected $43.28 on the high side and $31 on the low. So we're a little bit off. So what's going on here? Well, there's a couple of things that we're leaving out here. First of all, the current stock price is not really the stock price we should be using. Technically, it's what's called the forward price. And what we would do is we would scale out the stock price by the amount of the risk-free interest rate. So as a simple example, if we had a $100 stock and interest rates were 5% and we had a one-year option, we should use a stock price of 105 as the current stock price, even though it's trading for 100 And there's reasons we do that. It has to do with options pricing, but we would need to use what's called the future value of that stock. When you're dealing with shorter term questions like this for 30 days, and especially with almost zero interest rates, it's not going to amount to anything, maybe a couple of pennies. So I don't really worry about that unless you're dealing with longer term questions and or more expensive stocks. But the main reason we're off in our numbers here is that technically we should be using continuously compounded assumptions. I just added 612 and subtracted 612, which is not really continuously compounding it. So to do that, we're going to take our monthly volatility, 0.0836, two standard deviations, remember, 0.1672. And all you have to do is find on your calculator a little key that says e to the x, which is the exponential function. It's a way to look at continuously compounded rates. And you're going to take 0.1672, hit that e to the x key, and you get 1.182, which is, again, saying we're going to increase the current stock price by about 18% and decrease it by about 18%. So watch what happens now. I take my upper bound, 36.61 current stock price, times 1.182, gives me 43.27. For the lower bound, take E to the minus 0.1672. We get 0.846, which means we're going to just take about 84% of that stock price. And that's going to give us a lower bound of 30.97, or about 31. And so now if we compare these numbers to the numbers shown on the Thinkorswim platform, we'll see that they are almost dead on. There's some slight rounding just because we didn't account for the future value of the stock price. But at this point, we're really talking about pennies, and it really shouldn't enter into your decision. The basic idea is that over the next 30 days, based solely on volatility, we would expect eBay to have an upper price of about $43 and a lower price around $31. That's what you need to know. But you can see, much easier to just look at a probability of expiring cone in a platform, find that your lower price is 31 down here, your upper one 43.28, and now you know what it means. Thinkorswim also has another neat feature. We can look at different expirations, and it will show us the low and high for various stock prices at different points in time. But this is how they're generating these cones. The main point to understand is about the assumptions. Remember, we are assuming that volatility remains the same throughout the life of the option and that no news hits the market that shifts the bell curve. And based on the current volatility levels, a random walk would likely take the stock price to these levels. So you have two ways to approach your trading. You can either go with your gut instincts and hope. For everybody else, there's the Alpha Trader Certificate course teaching the art and science of options trading.